So our, our next speaker uh, is uh, Alice Shaw, who's a, an associate professor of medicine at Mass General Hospital. And, um, the title of her talk is uh, Targeting of uh, Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. Thank you and good morning. Uh, thanks to Bruce and the organizers for inviting me here today. Um, here are my disclosures. So uh, today my topic is targeting non-small cell lung cancer, and I wrote in 2011 because a lot of progress has been made in just the last few years. And of course, this whole talk is really going to center on the concept um, that non-small cell lung cancer is really not a single disease. That's what we used to think. Now we actually appreciate that non-small cell lung cancer really comprises many different subtypes, each of which can be defined by a different uh, genetic profile. And the hope, of course, is that the underlying genetics of the non-small cell lung cancer will dictate what the best and safest treatment is. So for example, patients who have this green mutation will, will be treated with a drug that specifically targets that mutation and so forth. So, I wanted to remind everyone about sort of the history of, of non-small cell lung cancer and what we've known about oncogenic drivers in non-small cell lung cancer. I would say before 2004, our understanding of the molecular basis of non-small cell lung cancer was rather limited. Um, we have known for a long time that roughly 20 to 25 percent of lung cancers do harbor an activating KRAS mutation that's shown here in the blue. However, before 2004, this was really the extent of our molecular understanding of non-small cell lung cancer, and certainly this really had no implications for treatments. However, in 2004, um, a pivotal discovery was made, which was that there are activating EGFR mutations in a subset of non-small cell lung cancer patients, about 10 to 15 percent of patients. And of course, these mutations are important because they confer exquisite sensitivity to EGFR inhibitors such as gefitinib and erlotinib. And now, just seven, year late, seven years later, we have a much more sophisticated understanding of some of the other oncogenic drivers in non-small cell lung cancer. And you can see here, we've now divided this pie into even smaller slices shown down here. The uh, focus today, of course, will be on some of the smaller slices, but I would like to remind you that even smaller slices of the pie for non-small cell lung cancer can translate into large absolute numbers of patients. So for example, ALK is present in roughly 3 to 5 percent of non-small cell lung cancer patients, and that actually translates into roughly six to 8,000 patients each year in the U.S. alone. You can also see from this pie chart that by by this time now, we've actually identified in a little over 50 percent of cases the oncogenic drivers. So we clearly have made progress so that it's just a little under 50 percent of patients where we haven't yet identified what the key oncogenic driver is. So today, um, I'm going to focus on some of the newer targets. Um, I'll begin with some of the uh, sort of established targeted therapy paradigms in lung cancer with just a brief mention of EGFR, since that was the first um, sort of targetable mutation that was discovered. We'll focus a lot on ELK. Um, there's been a lot of activity in ELK, and of course, everyone knows that the ELK inhibitor crizotinib was recently approved by the FDA. We'll also spend some time on uh, the newest kinase target in non-small cell lung cancer, which is ROS. And, uh, Remarkably enough, ROS is also targeted by crizotinib. And finally, we'll end with just a slide or two discussing one of the major issues with targeted therapies, which is the development of resistance. So this is just to remind everybody of um, the key discovery that was made in 2004 of activating EGFR mutations in a small subset of non-small cell lung cancer patients. Um, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Haber had noted that there were patients treated with the EGFR inhibitor ERISA or gefitinib that have uh, very impressive responses, as shown here, and uh, they went back and identified activating EGFR mutations, and this turns out to be the key predictor for response to uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These patients uh, tend to, tended to be never or light smokers, women, um, and with adenocarcinoma histology. A lot of work has been done since that time, and I just wanted to highlight one sort of key aspect of our understanding of EGFR mutations and the role of EGFR mutations um, in selecting therapies. This is a, a key study that was carried out by um, Tony Mock and his group. Um, this is the IPASS study. Um, published in the New England Journal in 2009. Here they um, identified patients with uh, clinical features of EGFR mutations. They did not know EGFR mutation status um, up front. And these patients were randomized to receive either first-line chemotherapy with carboplatin and paclitaxel or gefitinib up front. Um, and here the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. 
Uh, this slide summarizes what was seen um, with these patients based on their EGFR mutation status. So if patients turned out to have an EGFR mutation, you can see that the response rate was much higher to gefitinib compared to chemotherapy. And conversely, if the patient did not have an EGFR mutation as shown here, the, the response rate was much higher to standard chemotherapy compared to gefitinib. Similarly, uh, there was improved progressions-free survival depending on mutation status. So those patients who had an EGFR mutation had improved PFS when treated with gefitinib compared to chemotherapy. And conversely, if they were EGFR mutation negative, they had improved PFS with standard chemotherapy. So this study was very important um, in uh, suggesting that it's, you must know your EGFR mutation status up front. And since that study, there have since been four um, subsequent randomized control randomized controlled studies looking at first-line EGFR TKI use compared to chemotherapy in patients who have EGFR mutation. They're summarized here below the IPASS study. And all of these studies show that um, in patients with an EGFR mutation, that first-line EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy is superior to standard chemotherapy in terms of response rate and progression-free survival. And IPASS, it was also shown in terms of quality of life. Now, none of these studies um, have shown or are expected to show an overall survival benefit because, as you can imagine, those patients who are randomized to standard chemotherapy will eventually go on to receive the EGFR inhibitor in subsequent lines. But uh, the, uh, certainly the improvement in PFS and response rate is significant here. So this has really driven our current practice now of offering genotyping to all of our non-small cell lung cancer patients because we want to identify those patients up front who have an EGFR mutation in order to, to offer those patients first-line EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. So one of the newest targets, um, I'm going to switch gears to ELK, um, which is one of the newest targets. And um, as many of you know, this is kind of a refresher. Um, ELK was first discovered actually 15 years ago in the context of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. There it was discovered as a fusion with NPM or nucleophosmin. But ALK rearrangements were only discovered more recently in non-small cell lung cancer in 2007 by Dr. Hiromano's group in Japan. And um, actually there what they did was a very uh, traditional um, oncogene screen where they created a cDNA library from a patient's lung adenocarcinoma and did a, a transformation screen using mouse 3T3 cells and identified a cDNA that actually expressed a fusion of ELK, which stands for anaplastic lymphoma kinase, to a partner called EML4. And this led to the expression of a constitutively activated ELK because the intracellular tyrosine kinase domain of ELK is fused to EML4. Um, and this um, they showed, uh, and I'll show you in the next slide, um, this was oncogenic in vitro and in, in xenograft assays in vivo. We now know that there are other partners for ELK in non-small cell lung cancer besides EML4. There's also KIF5B ELK as well as TFG ELK, although the most common partner um, or fusion seems to be EML4 ELK. There are also ELK rearrangements in other diseases besides non-small cell lung cancer. As I mentioned, ELK was first discovered in the context of lymphoma. We do know that ELK rearrangements also occur in a rare type of sarcoma called inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. And there may be other solid tumors as well that have ELK rearrangements. We do know that um, pediatric neuroblastomas do have ELK amplifications or ELK activating mutations. And um, there's been re one recent report of anaplastic thyroid cancers also having activating ELK mutations. So ELK is a, a very important target in non-small cell lung cancer and will probably turn out to be an important target in other diseases as well. So this is from Dr. Mano's original report um, of EML4 ALK in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and this is showing the oncogenic activity of EML4 ALK in 3T3 assays and in nude mice. Um, and the important thing here is that when they created an EML4 ALK um, that was kinase dead, you completely obliterated the oncogenic activity um, in both of these assays. So clearly it was the kinase function of the EML4 ALK fusion that was critical for transformation. Um, they also used a small molecule to inhibit ALK and to show that the inhibition of ALK could lead to uh, tumor regression as well. Um, in subsequent studies, um, the settlement group here at MGH uh, performed a cell line-based screen, actually not with uh, 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 crizotinib, but with a different ALK inhibitor, TAE684, screened a panel of cell lines and looked for sensitivity of these cell lines to this 
very potent ALK inhibitor. And what they found was that among the top 10 most sensitive cell lines to TAE684, nine of those were cell lines harboring abnormalities in ALK, so either ALK amplification, ALK mutations, or ALK rearrangement, um, suggesting that ALK uh, could indeed be a very good target um, for cancer therapy. So with the uh, discovery of EMF4-ALK in, in lung cancer, um, the next question really was, well, how do we identify these patients? And here, Dr. Iafredi at Mass General um, started working on a diagnostic test. Um, and what he used were um, commercially available probes from, uh, from Abbott um, that uh, are shown here in red and green. They flank the highly conserved translocation site with an ALK. And in the presence of a rearrangement, these probes are now split apart, and you see splitting of the red and green signals as shown here, as compared to the uh, fuse signal, which shows up as, as a yellow. And so uh, John was able to uh, sort of optimize this assay. This is just to remind you that um, the fish assay seems kind of simple in principle, but actually in practice it can be very tricky. There are many different splitting patterns. And here's one common variation that we see. We call it an isolated red or isolated three prime, where you just see a red and you actually have loss of the green signal. So this is also a positive um, ALK case. And there can be other very um, subtle split signals. So this is somewhat of a challenging assay. Um, in the beginning, when uh, Dr. Iafredi was developing this assay, he did uh, perform other assays to confirm the presence of ALK translocation. We can uh, also confirm ALK rearrangement using RT-PCR for the exact EML4 ALK fusion or whatever the partner is fused to ALK. And we also can use um, immunohistochemistry with ALK-specific antibodies to detect the presence of ALK in, in the lung. ALK normally is not expressed at all in the, in the adult lung, and so really the bat, there's no background here. And so when you see brown staining, that really indicates that the, the presence of an ALK rearrangement. So we have three different ways of identifying a patient with ALK, although the gold standard currently remains the fish assay that was, uh, that was developed um, early on. So with this fish assay in hand, uh, we started, uh, we and others started screening patients um, to identify who, who could be the ALK positive patients and what the key clinical pathologic features are that are associated with ALK. And this is just a summary of the features that many case series um, have identified. We know that the ALK positive patients tend to be never or light smokers. They tend to be younger, on average, about 10 to 15 year, years younger than the average non muscle lung cancer patient. Unlike EGFR mutations, ALK rearrangements are not associated with any gender bias. Most patients have adenocarcinoma, and the specific type of adenocarcinoma tends to be a solid growth pattern, um, often with abundant signet ring cells. And then the other important thing about ALK rearrangement is that ALK does tend to be mutually exclusive with other key oncogenic drivers like EGFR and KRAS, so these tend to really not overlap in our patients. So knowing those clinical pathologic features were actually, was actually very important because once we knew those, we were actually able to think about how to target, how to identify those patients. And the reason we wanted to identify those patients is because it just happened that there was already an ALK inhibitor in clinical trials. This is crizotinib or PF234-1066. It had already gone into a phase one dose escalation trial one year prior to Dr. Mano's discovery in 2007. And so uh, with this trial up and running, the next really important step was to identify those patients that were ALK positive. And knowing the clinical pathologic features allowed investigators who were working on this trial to really hone in on a population of patients who we would predict would be clinically enriched for having an ALK rearrangement. So this is just to um, show you the uh, structure of crizotinib and to show you that it is a dual MET and ALK inhibitor. Um, you can see it does have, uh, this is part of the kinase profile, and the, the top two um, kinases that are hit by crizotinib are MET and ALK, and these two kinases are predicted to be the only ones that are hit at physiologically relevant doses in patients. This is the dose escalation and, um, schema for um, the crizotinib um, phase one trial. And as I mentioned, uh, we had already started this trial. Actually, this was started at five centers around the world, um, including MGH, and had started one year prior to even knowing about ALK and lung cancer. By the time we started identifying patients um, with ALK positive lung cancer, the trial had already gone up to cohort five, um, 300 milligrams twice daily. So we were already actually at a supra therapeutic dose when we enrolled the first ALK positive patient in December of 07, about four months after Dr. Mano's discovery.
The trial had already been set up to not only include a dose escalation phase, but also then to have a dose expansion phase, and there was already interest in looking at molecularly enriched cohorts, although at the time the trial was initially designed, the main cohort of interest was going to be MET amplified um, solid tumors such as gastric and esophageal cancers. So we enrolled the first patient, um, as I said, in December of 07 in this cohort, and this patient um, actually had a, was one of these patients who was very sick when we first uh, started and uh, had one of these dramatic um, turnarounds. Six months later, we enrolled a second ALK-positive patient. This was at the BI, and this patient also had a very dramatic turnaround, um, and this led then to uh, really uh, the... Um, I think a lot of interest in enrolling ALK patients from around the world into a dose expansion cohort for ALK positive patients. And so that's what's shown here. This is data that was presented by Dr. Kamage at ASCO this past year. These are 119 patients who went onto the phase one trial. These patients were all prospectively screened for ALK rearrangement um, at uh, five or six centers around the world. This summarizes the clinical characteristics of these patients, which is similar to what I showed you before. They tend to be younger, never or light smokers with adenocarcinoma histology. And here is the waterfall plot that was presented in uh, just this past uh, ASCO, showing you that almost all patients do have a response to crizotinib. The response rate here was 61%, um, but an additional you know, 25 to 30% of patients do have a response, although they don't meet criteria for a partial response. And then there's really only a small proportion of patients, less than 10%, that for some reason, even though they do harbor ALK rearrangement, are um, intrinsically resistant to crizotinib. But really the key point here is that almost all patients do respond um, to this uh, ALK inhibitor. Um, since then, we've gone on to show similar responses in the phase two trial. This was presented by Dr. Riley at World Lung um, this past summer. Again, you can see over 100 patients here treated on the phase two trial. Um, almost identical waterfall plots. Um, here it was, I think, believe, 51% response rate, but again, almost all patients do respond. We also now have some data on progression-free survival of, um, of these patients when treated with crizotinib. These are patients from the phase one trial, and you can see that the median progression-free survival was 10 months. This is very similar to what we see with EGFR inhibitors and EGFR mutant lung cancer, where many trials have now shown that the median progression-free survival in EGFR mutant patients is roughly 9 to 12 months with EGFR inhibitor therapy. So very similar to what, what we would predict, actually. We also now have some data um, suggesting that there may be an overall survival benefit, and you would expect this to be the case given the dramatic response rates and progression-free survivals that we've seen. This is data that we presented at ASCO this past year. This is actually a retrospective analysis. Here we had to compare patients from the phase one trial to a group of patients who had been screened around the same time, but for various reasons had never received crizotinib. So this is not part of a randomized trial. This was done retrospectively to try and get a sense of how much crizotinib may improve survival for these patients. The analysis was further complicated because we really had to narrow in on patients that we could uh, feel were adequately matched from a clinical standpoint. So this is showing you patients who were treated with crizotinib as their second or third line therapy on the phase one trial. This is their overall survival here. And we compare those to patients also ALK positive, but for various reasons had never received crizotinib, but had received a standard therapy. And you can see their overall survival here. This difference was highly statistically significant, and the hazard ratio was 0.36, suggesting that crizotinib does indeed probably improve overall survival in, the, in these patients. Uh, <clears throat> what we've also seen besides the uh, efficacy with crizotinib is we've seen very good safety. The safety profile is pretty impressive. Um, by and large, most of the toxicities have been grade one with a few grade two toxicities. The most significant toxicities have probably been uh, related to transaminitis. We've had a few cases of grade three and grade four transaminitis, and also a few cases of, of drug-induced pneumonitis. But overall, this drug is extremely well tolerated. So this leads us to uh, the current state of, of crizotinib, at least in this country. And as many of you know, crizotinib was recently granted accelerated approval by the FDA. And I wanted to point out a couple things about the label that are important for us to realize. So first of all, um, this uh, approval was based purely on the response rate. So those two waterfall plots that I showed you from the phase one and phase two trials really is what led um, to this approval, not the progression-free survival or the overall survival, just really response rate, um, because that response rate really is so impressive in a group of non-small cell lung cancer patients. 
Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out is that the label is for both locally advanced as well as metastatic um, patients, not just metastatic patients. And the other thing I wanted to point out, which is very important, is that the label made no specification about prior lines of therapy, which is interesting to me because really the data from the phase one and of course the phase two trials are primarily from patients who have been previously treated. In the phase one trial, there were only 15 patients who received first line crizotinib, so we have very, very limited data on first line crizotinib use. But in those 15 patients, the response rate was 80%. Um, and uh, I've heard that progression-free survival was quite impressive, but the numbers are just very small. Nevertheless, I think given the EGFR, the precedent, the EGFR precedent, um, as well as I think the, the impressive uh, activity that was seen, the FDA approved this drug for use regardless of Lyme, meaning that patients who are newly diagnosed with ALK-positive lung cancer can receive crizotinib in this country. Now we do have several trials ongoing um, to better evaluate the comparison of crizotinib's activity to standard chemotherapy, and possibly to get a glimpse into um, survival benefit. Profile 1007 is the second line registration trial comparing crizotinib to standard second line therapy, either pemetrexid or docetaxel. This trial is actually over 90% accrued at this point. Um, it's been accruing at around, I believe, 170 sites around the world. We're nearing, nearing goal accrual. There's also the phase two trial. I showed you some data from that already. This phase two trial is both meant to capture those patients who were randomized to standard chemotherapy, then progressed. It allows those patients to technically cross over and receive crizotinib. And this phase two trial also captures all patients beyond second line. We now have, I believe, over 600 patients who are on the phase two trial. And there is an ongoing first-line trial as well, also accruing currently. This trial will randomize ALK-positive patients to either crizotinib or a standard first-line regimen of platinum and pemetrexid, and there will be crossover as well. Because of the crossover effect, we're expecting it will be difficult to actually know what the true overall survival benefit is of crizotinib, so the types of retrospective analysis that I showed you may really be our only real understanding of the survival benefit that's conferred by crizotinib. So this leads us now to kind of a more refined um, view of non-small cell lung cancer and, and how we should approach patients when we first meet them. Certainly, uh, we and many others um, around the country believe in genotyping up front, now both to look for EGFR mutations and now also to look for the presence of ALK. Um, if ALK is found, we can use crizotinib in the first-line se setting as a standard therapy in this country, or we can consider enrollment on the first-line trial. So let's talk about the newest um, target in non-small cell lung cancer, and this is very exciting to us. Um, this actually, ROS rearrangements uh, were first discovered um, actually in the context of GBM, and this was done by a group at MIT, um, Dr. Hausman's group, where they discovered that ROS, which is also a receptor tyrosine kinase, can be rearranged and fused abnormally to a partner protein in GBM. It was found to be FIG. Um, although prior to even that, we knew that ROS uh, was, an, was an oncogene that could be overexpressed and sometimes amplified in some GBMs. Um, in 2007, also actually just a couple months after Dr. Mano's report of ALK in lung cancer, uh, the cell signaling group out in Beverly um, reported uh, findings from their technology. They called it PhosphoScan technology. It's basically phosphotyrosine antibody pulldown, where they're looking for activated tyrosine kinases. And what they found is that in one patient and in one cell line, they identified rearrangement of this ROS oncogene to either a protein SLC3482 or CD74, um, suggesting that um, these fusions could be oncogenic in lung cancer. I should note that this group also found um, ALK fusions in non-small cell lung cancer as well. I showed you this slide a little bit earlier, and I wanted to point out that, as I mentioned, there were um, of the top 10 cell lines that were sensitive to this ALK inhibitor, TAE684, in a screen performed by Jeff Settlement's group. Nine of those 10 had abnormalities in ALK, but one of those 10 was, H was HCC78, which actually has a ROS rearrangement. So this suggested to us, even back in 2008, that ROS could be a target for an ALK inhibitor like TAE684. Now, why would this be? Well, it turns out that ROS and ALK are actually in the same family. It's the same insulin um, receptor superfamily, and they actually share a fair amount of homology within the tyrosine kinase domain, and that's shown here. This slide was put together by one of our collaborators, Ignatius, at UC Irvine. So knowing that uh, ROS could be a target of, of 
crizotinib and potentially other ALK inhibitors as well. Um, Dr. Iafredi set out to, again, develop a diagnostic or screening test for ROS rearrangements in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, he actually has some home brewing, um, homegrown uh, probes for doing this and actually developed a, another split apart fish assay for ROS rearrangement. And working together with Vanderbilt, Dr. Powell's group, um, we started screening all of the non-small cell lung cancer patients both here and at Vanderbilt. And this is data that uh, will be published soon in uh, JCO. What we found is that ROS is rather rare. Um, it's probably three or four times less common than ALK. It's present in one to two percent of our patients. Um, and actually, interestingly, ROS patients seem to be very similar to ALK patients in terms of clinical path features. So they tend to be very young, very similar in age to the ALK patients, and they tend to be never or light smokers, also tend to be primarily adenocarcinoma histology. So once we started identifying ROS patients, we now started thinking about how we could treat them um, with crizotinib. And uh, the trial actually has many different expansion cohorts, and one of them is a ROS expansion cohort. So I'm going to share with you a case that's part of the publication that's coming out soon. This is a patient of mine um, that we saw actually in February, um, but he had first been diagnosed in August of 2010. This is a young man, never smoker, originally from the Congo. And back in August of 2010, he was living in Georgia, still living in Georgia, and he was becoming increasingly short of breath, and his primary care doctor thought he might have asthma. So he was treated with different inhalers and antibiotics and things like that, um, but, but then it became clear that he wasn't improving, and in August he had this scan, which showed very diffuse disease. He underwent a bronchoscopy with biopsy, and it confirmed the presence of bronchoalveolar carcinoma, which we now call AIS, or adeno in situ, adenocarcinoma in situ. Since he was a never smoker, um, he was started empirically on erlotinib. Um, they did not have genetic testing back yet at that time. Um, he did not experience any response to erlotinib um, and actually was referred to us in February. So we met him at around this time when he was actually quite sick and he was off treatment. And in February, we started doing some genetic testing for him. We found that he did not have an EGFR mutation, which we would expect given his lack of response to erlotinib. He did not have ALK rearrangement either. And at this point, we decided to test him for ROS. And actually, back in April, we finally got his ROS test back, and he actually was positive. So this is now where he is when we enrolled him on the phase one trial of crizotinib. So at this time in April, he was actually quite sick. His, as you can see, his lung disease had worsened significantly. He was very hypoxic, um, and he had a compensatory uh, polycythemia with a hematocrit of 60. But because he was so young, he was actually in reasonably good shape. So we treated him with crizotinib at the standard dose of 250 milligrams twice a day. And this is the scan actually just eight weeks later. Um, and this is, a, again, a classic example of what we see with the EGFR mutant patients who get an EGFR inhibitor and our ALK patients who get crizotinib, very similar type of transformation. In just a few days, he noticed a dramatic improvement in his breathing. By the time we saw him back at two weeks, he was already you know, well on his way to recovery, satting over 95% at that time. And in this scan, at eight weeks just confirmed what we saw clinically, that this patient really was responding well to crizotinib, and this was a very, um, what we call, oncogene-addicted tumor. And he actually did meet criteria for 100% response. This patient continues to maintain his 100% response as of, as of October. I just saw him a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so this is very exciting to us. There are more ROS patients who have gone on to the crizotinib trial, and they, ROS does seem to be sort of a very good target for crizotinib. So now I've modified this slide to show you that I think this is kind of a prediction for the future. Not only will we be screening for EGFR mutations and ELK, but we'll also be screening for ROS rearrangements as well, and probably at some point in the future be able to offer these patients a good targeted therapy like crizotinib in the first-line setting. So I'm just going to end on, on sort of the big challenge for targeted therapies, and Dr. Engelman is going to pick up on this um, and go into some of the more lab-based experiments. Um, but th of course, the big problem with targeted therapies is that patients do inevitably develop resistance. It typically occurs by about one year after treatment with the targeted therapy. This is a patient of mine who had a near complete CR after um, actually just eight weeks of crizotinib. She had ALK positive lung cancer, great response um, at eight weeks. And then after a year, this is pretty much all she had left of her bronchoalveolar carcinoma. And then very slowly over the next year, she had progression um, of, her, of her multifocal lung infiltrates. And this is a common pattern that we see that patients can slowly progress, even while they're on crizotinib, still maintaining you know, great clinical benefit, but they're slowly, their tumor is slowly growing back and becoming resistant. 
We have a lot of understanding of TKI resistance from the EGFR story, and I'm just sharing this with you. This is work that was done by Dr. Sequist um, and our group at Mass General, looking at different mechanisms of resistance in EGFR, mutant lung cancer. And in a large series of patients that they rebiopsy, they found that there were several different mechanisms, and some of these we knew about before, of course. Um, about half of the patients with EGFR mutations acquire a secondary T790M or gatekeeper mutation. There are other genetic changes as well, including um, activation of bypass tracts like MET and PI3 kinase. And interestingly, in about 14% of patients who become resistant to EGFR inhibitors, there can also be a change in histology to a small cell uh, histology. So this is a very, this idea of the different types of resistance mechanisms mechanisms is similar to what we see in ALK. We also can see secondary resistance mutations as well as bypass tracts. Um, Dr. Mano's group first reported the discovery of secondary ALK mutations actually about a year ago when he reported one patient who had benefited from crizotinib, had been doing well, became resistant. They rebiopsied this patient and found that he actually had two different resistance mutations, a gatekeeper, L1196M, which is analogous to T790M, as well as a different mutation in the kinase domain, C1156Y. And these mutations conferred resistance to crizotinib. We now know actually that there can be many different types of secondary resistance mutations in ALK. This is actually an in vitro study that was done by the Ariad group and reported at AECR about a year and a half ago, where they screened and found a number of different crizotinib resistance mutations. And you can see that they occur in all different areas of the tyrosine kinase domain of ALK. And we're beginning to see this in our patients as well, that there can be many different um, secondary resistance mutations. So unlike EGFR, where there really just seems to be one gatekeeper mutation, there are many different mutations that can occur in ALK, and Dr. Engelman will talk about this uh, in a bit. So I wanted to end with just uh, sort of a slide summarizing the time frame of crizotinib's de development, which is pretty remarkable. Here is the first uh, report of EML4 ALK in lung cancer in August of 07. The studies that were done between the phase one, phase two, and phase three studies, and now, of course, just four years after that report, um, FDA approval in this country. So what is the future for crizotinib now that we have all this data? Well, there are, as I mentioned, other ALK-driven malignancies, such as anaplastic large cell lymphomas, IMTs, and probably other pediatric neuroblastomas, others that uh, we're now looking at um, in terms of crizotinib's activity. We know now that there are other molecular targets of crizotinib besides ROS. Of course, there's MET, which was the original target for crizotinib. And a large focus, um, at least of our research and other um, people's research, is looking at how to overcome resistance to crizotinib and other targeted therapies and using a number of different um, tools, such as second generation ALK inhibitors that are more potent, structurally different, and also thinking about combinatorial approaches to overcoming resistance. So I'll just end with that pie chart that I showed you. And here, the point of this is to emphasize not only do we know about all these um, oncogenic drivers in non-small cell lung cancer, but we're really beginning to make a lot of progress in matching these targets to targeted therapies, many of which, like crizotinib, are showing a lot of progress. So I'll end with um, acknowledgments, obviously, the MGH thoracic group and pathology, particularly Dr. Iafrady. And of course, in terms of all the ALK work, there are many, many investigators from around the world who have worked incredibly hard um, on developing crizotinib, and in particular, I would recognize the Pfizer development team as well, um, and of course, our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. That was a great presentation. Um, maybe I'll start off and just uh, ask you about what, what trials are ongoing right now for crizotinib failures? Uh, uh, a number of trials. So uh, there are several different second-generation ALK inhibitors that are in the clinic already. Um, Chugai has a compound that's in Japan that's actually already in phase two trials. Novartis has a uh, second-generation ALK inhibitor. Estelos, I think um, there's altogether four ALK inhibitors that I know of um, mm. that are in clinical trials in this country or in Asia. Mm. There are also some combinations that we're looking at. Um, Pfizer had already been looking at a combination of crizotinib with uh, the PAN-HER inhibitor, PF299804, that was initially primarily focused at EGFR mutant patients because, as I mentioned, EGFR mutant patients can develop MET amplification as a mechanism of resistance. Mm -hmm. Crizotinib targets MET. The idea had oh, been yeah. to try yeah. and combine those two for EGFR-resistant patients, but of course, um, there could be a role for that combination in ALK-resistant patients as well. So I think there are combinations that are um, slowly percolating through, and some of them are already in the clinic. Mm 
HSP90 inhibitors? Yep, and HSP90 inhibitors. So that's a very good question. Um, IPI-504 is an HSP-90 inhibitor made by Infinity um, that had been in a phase two trial um, actually several years ago, and there had been some response, again, that had primarily been geared at EGFR-resistant patients, and they had seen actually some reasonable responses um, lasting over six months. And when Dr. Sequist, um, together with Dr. Iafredi, went back and looked at the molecular uh, genetics of those patients who responded, a few of those actually turned out to have ALK rearrangement. And that was really the first um, mm -hmm. glimpse into the uh, potential activity of HSP90 inhibitors in ALK rearranged lung cancers. And since then, a number of other HSP90 inhibitors have been tested in ALK patients. There certainly is activity in crizotinib sensitive patients. Mm -hmm. Whether or not there will be activity in crizotinib resistant mm -hmm. patients, we don't okay. know yet, but we're looking as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Bruce. What So there is activity in med. There's already a rep uh, case report in JTO, um, I believe about six months ago, showing activity of crizotinib in a met amplified patient. There's another case report coming out as well. So uh, there has been some activity that's been observed and that's now going to be reported. How, how durable that is, though, is, is really the main question. And how good of a driver met amplification is is also uh, not clear. I, I have a question. So in, in the patients that um, have no smoking history, do you all ever evaluate whether they were pre-exposed as, you know, are they secondhand smoke in a family or something like this? Is, is there anything that accounts for this early, you know, uh, event that might have caused some type of change? It's a great question. We don't know, but it is very notable that both ALK and ROS um, is, and EGFR, of course, are very, very strongly linked to never smoking. It's clearly not a smoking related, these aren't smoking related diseases. Alk and Ross are also notable because those patients definitely are younger than the average patient. And we don't have a good understanding of why that is. Certainly in our clinics, we will ask about other exposures, including secondhand smoke and any other exposures, but there's no, we haven't really been doing it in sort of a systematic way. And it's actually, as you can imagine, very hard to quantitate secondhand smoke. There are indices for doing that, um, but we don't really have that information. But I think going forward, that will be a very important question. I think it's probably a combination of some underlying genetic susceptibility as well as probably an environmental exposure that we just don't know about yet. We have a question in the back. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, thank you for your presentation. My question is, with the, the, the patients that are acquiring resistance, so the targeted therapies, do you also start to see any changes in their response to chemotherapy, or have any of them been tried back on chemotherapy after they've developed resistance? Yep, it's a good question. I think we don't have the answers quite yet. As you can imagine, many of these patients are, have only recently been on crizotinib, and we don't have that much post-crizotinib sort of follow-up on those patients. Um, there can be different, uh, I would say kinetics of relapse, meaning the example I showed you was a, kind of a typical patient who's slowly re progressing on crizotinib, but there can actually be patients who have quite rapid uh, relapses once they become resistant to crizotinib, so there's kind of a spectrum in terms of how patients progress. Um, I would say we've seen all different things after they progress in terms of whether or not they respond to chemo. And again, I think as we get more experience and more time to look at these patients, we'll have a better understanding of their chemo sensitivity both before and after crizotinib. Martin. Here at uh, the Chapner Colloquium Number One, you you presented a, a magnificent paper. Uh, this year it was uh, equally magnificent, but you also got a gasp. You know when you when you showed those uh, before and after of your of your Ross first Ross patient, um, you know it, it it was really spectacular. Um, the fact that also, ironically, in just this one year period of time with the approval in August, I think August the 26th or thereabouts of, uh, of crizotinib, today is the launch of, uh, of uh, Zalcori crizotinib, and isn't it neat to have it launched in Boston? <laughs> And the fellow who's going to be responsible for that launch is sitting right behind me, right. and I bet he'd like to say a few words, Mace Rothenberg. Put me on the spot, Marty. Well, first, I'd like to, to thank you, Alice and, and Jeff, and the whole team here at Mass General, John I, Freddy, wherever he might be, uh, has just really done a terrific job. When I talk about this, I really talk about this as a combination of good science, good collaboration, uh, good communication, and good luck. So mm -hmm. I think that right. this is really uh, shows you the power of the ability of, of industry and academia to work together when it, when it really works, how much it could help all of our patients. So, right. so thank you.